All right, in this video, I want to talk about some exhortation. I want to lift you up and encourage you to trust the Lord, to believe in his word, and to know that he has saved you and that you should rest in this. Now, the reason why I'm putting together this video here and I don't know if I'm going to splice it together with this next part I'm going to do or make it in two parts. Not sure yet. But almost every Saturday, I end up talking to Seventh-day Adventists and Sabbatarians who, you know, they're legalists. They're Pharisees. And they are telling you that you need to keep the, the letter of the law and you need to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath or else you're not saved. You're going to go to hell. Right? And it's just kind of strange because I asked them, is that the gospel that you're told to preach to the world? You go tell the world that keep the law and honor the Sabbath and maybe, hopefully, if you cross your fingers, you'll be saved. Is, is that the good news that Jesus was preaching? That the apostles and the disciples went out preaching to the, to the world? No, it's not. Not at all. You you ask these people what the gospel is and the, the good news, they have no idea. They they basically think the good news is it, you're still under the Old Testament. You got to keep the law or you'll go to hell. That's the good news, right? But those of us who have a, a at least a little bit of humility and are honest with ourselves. We know that that's not good news at all because we haven't kept the law. And in order to be justified by the law, you have to keep it perfect. Right? In order for the law to declare you righteous, you couldn't have offended in any point. And if you offend the law in any point, then you're guilty of the whole law. Which shows that these people generally are hypocrites, right? Because... They'll condemn me, say I'm a Sabbath breaker, but then if I ask them if they're sinless and they say no, I'll be like, well, then you're a Sabbath breaker because if you sin at all, you're guilty of breaking the whole law. So if you're going to condemn me for being a Sabbath breaker, then you need to stop being a Sabbath breaker. They don't see how they come across as hypocrites and condescending and just arrogant and full of themselves because when you tell other people to keep the law, and be perfect and holy as your Father in heaven is perfect and holy. You are basically saying, I am perfect and holy. That's why I get to tell you to be perfect and holy. You need to be like me and follow God like I am and be perfect and holy. And you don't see how just arrogant and full of yourself that you come across. And that they're blind to it. I... I bet they think that they are walking by faith and that they're humble people. And it's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy how they can actually see the opposite. But, uh, yeah. So anyway, I, I've been talking to them about the scriptures that say that you're saved. And that's what I want to get into here, showing that you're saved. Uh, but the problem with Christians is the same thing that happened with Israel. God saved them out of Egypt and was bring them to the promised land. And he said that he's going to bring them to the promised land, flowing with milk and honey, and that he himself is going to take care of the inhabitants there. And they find out that the inhabitants are giants, and they're like, we can't take them. But what they're saying is God can't take them. Because God said that he is going to do it, not them. So it shows their lack of belief, their faith, right? So God had them wander in the wilderness for 40 years, and only those that had the faith remained and were brought into the promised land, right? They trusted God. That's what saves you, faith alone. And faith is just believing and trusting God. And... These people don't see how they lack faith. They think, no, the giants are too big for God to take. 
and those giants are sin. So I need to help God to save me from these giants. Right? And they just, they're blind thinking that they have faith. And it just doesn't make sense. Especially when we have the scriptures that say, the law is not a faith. <laughs> right? But their whole basis is the law. Well, what are you going to do? So anyway, uh, let's actually get into the scriptures here. In Romans chapter 5, at verse 11, it says, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So we see now, presently, received, past tense, the atonement. Right? Atonement is at one minute with God. To be at one with God, you have to have been cleansed of your sins and made holy. That's what the atonement is, to be at one with God. And it says right there, we have presently received it. That's because when you believe the gospel, the word of truth, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit is with you, in you. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. That's how you have at one minute with God. You can just walk into the throne room, walk into the most holy place, and be like, good day, Father. I hope you, you're, you're enjoying yourself as best you can with what's going on in the world. Right? You can have that boldness, not because of anything about yourself. If you had that boldness because of yourself, you, you got some issues, right? We have that because... It says here, verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood. See, past tense, justified. We've already been justified. Not being justified, now justified. It, it doesn't just say justified, as in it's already happened. But now, right, it's really emphasizing justified by his blood. Right? We shall be saved from wrath through him, because through Jesus Christ, taking the wrath of God on him for us, we shall be saved from the wrath to come because of him. Now, this is where a lot of these people like to dismiss what it says here. This says you will be saved. Just like I said, you shall receive a hundred dollars. Right? From me. You shall receive $100 from me. Now, basic English, you're going to think, oh, you're going to give me $100. There's no if, ands, ors, or buts. There's no conditions that need to be met. Right? It's a guarantee. You shall. I, that's what I said. You shall receive 100 bucks from me. And a note here, I'm not saying any of you are going to receive 100 bucks from me. This is just an example, okay? So don't anybody comment asking me for a hundred bucks, okay? But anyway, so if I say that, you shall receive a hundred bucks from me. If I say that, okay? Then you're going to take that as you will receive it. Now, when, I didn't stipulate when, I just said you will receive it, right? So this is saying will be saved, not might be saved, could be saved, you know, if you jump through enough flaming hoops while squeezing a bowling ball with your butt, uh, you might hopefully be saved. No, it says shall be, as in you will be, right? As it goes on to say, for if en when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, again, reconciled, past tense, already happened, we shall be saved by his life. That's a will going to. Right? Now, why does it say future, but here it says present? 
Well, it's because presently we're saved, but we're not going to see this salvation until the future. Because like with a lot of the people who are alive at this time, they died in the flesh, right? Their bodies gave out or they were martyred. Something along those lines happened. So they're going to receive what they've already have later on when they're resurrected or we, when we are hopefully alive, when Jesus returns and are translated. But we can see by comparing scripture to scripture that there's also passages where it tells us we are presently saved. Like right here, verse 10 of 2 Timothy chapter 2, it says, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So we see here, they may also obtain the salvation. So Paul is saying that he's already obtained the salvation. Right? He already has it. He's already saved. And this is a man that says that he still sins. That his flesh gets him to do the things he doesn't want to do. And keeps him from doing the things that he does want to do. But it's not him. It's the sin that dwells in him. Because there's nothing good in the flesh. But he here says that he has obtained salvation. And he's doing these things. Such as suffering all these different things. So that others may obtain the same salvation that he has. That's what I end up talking to these people about a lot. Is they're like, well, if you don't need to be saved. You know, why don't you commit adultery? Why, why don't you do just whatever? And they're basically revealing their character and what's in their heart, the things that they want to do, but they don't do, right? And it's like, well, for starters, I thought the law was about loving God and loving your fellow man, right? I, I love and appreciate God and what he's done. Why would I want to do that and ruin the light that he could be reflecting off of me to reach family and friends? Why would I want to ruin that? And what about loving others? Like, don't you love and care about your wife? I do. And why would I want to hurt her like that? Right? The law is not about, uh, I mean, just because you're saved doesn't mean you go live a selfish life. Why would you do that? It just doesn't make any sense. But they think because you're saved anyway, why not do it? Well, like Paul says here, that others may get saved. It's like, do you not care about anybody but yourself? Is the only reason to obey God is for selfish reasons so that you can save yourself? It's showing their true heart that they're not doing this because they love God and they love others. They're doing it so they can escape hell so that they can have eternal life for themselves. And by doing that, they're breaking the law. Because the law is not about loving yourself and being selfish, but about loving God and loving others. Right? So, let's continue. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. There's a couple of passages here in 1 Corinthians that we'll end up getting into. Uh, but here's the first one here at verse 18. It says, For the preaching of the cross is them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. So you see there another passage saying, Presently we are saved. Let's read on. It says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For what? For after that, and the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Believe what? The preaching of the cross. By the foolishness of preaching, the preaching of the cross, God saves those that believe. Right? And to those that are saved, that is the power of God. He's slayed the giants. He's fulfilled the promises. We're just waiting on them. And while we're waiting, we're trying to get other people to go with us. Right? 
but we see that these other people they're too smart and they're too wise and they try to make God into a man like themselves where because they think in like I wouldn't do that I wouldn't die for my enemies and I wouldn't just give them a free ticket into paradise no they're gonna have to pay for what they've done and by their own words they're gonna be judged right so they're gonna have to go through what they would put others through as we see that Christ ah, Christ crucified is a stumbling block to the Jews and to the Greeks it's foolishness because of the Jews like these people who are under the law right they're legalists they're Pharisees uh, like the Seventh-day Adventists and the Sabbatarians and such Jesus crucified is a stumbling block to them because they're like Wait, I'm saved by God's righteousness in his obedience to the law, in him cleansing me with his blood, and not by me keeping the law? They don't get it, right? They, they see it as you're enticing them to sin because their mindset is the only reason why I'm doing this is to save myself, and if I don't have to do this these things to be saved, then why would I do them? And it's like, well, what happened to the love for God and love for your fellow man? It just disappeared. <clears throat> like with a lot of these people, I start preaching this. And since they got this Jewish mindset, they're saying that I'm preaching, do as thou wilt. Because I've said that once you accept Jesus, you could end up doing the worst things and still be saved. And they were saying, you're preaching, do as you will. I'm like, no, I'm not. Matter of fact, I'll do it right here. Don't do as you will. Submit yourself to God. Do what is right. Right? Love God and appreciate what he's done for you. Love your fellow man and give yourself for them. Sacrifice your life for others. And that doesn't necessarily mean go die for them, but it means sacrifice your time and your energy for them that they may get the gospel and be saved. Right? Don't go live like the world. Don't deny Christ. Don't become a Muslim. Don't become a Satanist. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't sacrifice and molest children. Don't do all these evil things. Right? Don't do as I will. Don't. Do what is right. Okay? So if any of these jackasses want to come out and be like, you're preaching, do as I will. You're lying. It's your sinful nature that says that because you would on, are only obeying God or trying to anyway to save yourself. And if you didn't have to do it to be saved, you wouldn't. Which shows your own decrepit, wretched, vile heart. It reveals your own character. But anyway... In Mark 16, it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So we see here, again, shall be saved. And the connection is with believing. Right? Because if you believe, you shall be saved. But if you believe not, you're condemned. It doesn't say if you're not baptized, you're condemned. But it's just focused on the believing. Right? But if you believe... Why wouldn't you get water baptized, right? It's not a requirement to be saved, but it's just an outward sign like a, a wedding ring showing that you believe and that you're married, right? So, again, shall be saved. It's not a might, maybe. Again, it's like if the church was saying, whoever's baptized shall receive a hundred bucks. You'd be like, okay, got baptized, where's my hundred bucks? They'd be like, no, uh, you're not getting it. Why? Well, you didn't meet the conditions. Well, you said whoever's baptized gets 100 bucks. I met the standard, so why don't I get it? Right? Because this is a, a guarantee, will, not a might, could be. If you believe and then keep the law and never break the Sabbath, then you'll be saved. 
It's not what it says. Right? Not what it says. Luke 7. I like this one. At verse 47 it says, Wherefore I say unto thee, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said unto the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. So here, we have a woman saved by faith alone, and this is her soul being saved. Because she's not saved from a fire. She's not saved from a quicksand. She's not saved from a murderer. Her flesh is not saved in any way whatsoever here. She's not in any mortal danger to her physical body. But she's saved by her faith. Well, it has to do with her sins being forgiven. Her immortal soul is saved by her faith. Or I should say, through her faith. Right? So, again here, present tense, saved. By what? The faith. Not because she kept the Sabbath, obeyed the law perfectly, or anything like that. Nothing. Like it says, her sins are forgiven. A lot of people take this to mean, oh, her sins up until that point. No, it's all of them. Right? A lot of these people say, do you think God's unfair and unjust? And I say no. And a lot of this has to do with hell. And they're like, so you think in someone like Cain, he didn't repent and he was a murderer. So he goes to hell. So he's been in hell for about 6,000 years. And somebody who murders today and dies and goes to hell because they didn't repent. Do you think that's fair? And he's like, yeah, why isn't it fair? And they say, because they're both going to be in eternity for hell, but Cain's in there first. He was like, yeah, well, Cain committed murder 6,000 years ago. And yeah, he died 6,000 years ago. So yeah, should he wait until everybody who's murders has murdered and they all get thrown into the lake of fire at once? Is that just? Because then you'd say, how come Cain had got to wait 6,000 years, but then uh, this man who, who died today, he, he, he gets thrown in right away. How's that fair, right? I mean, it's just kind of stupid things that they try to use to uh, dismiss your arguments, dismiss your your preaching and your teaching. And uh, uh, I like to take that same argument about God being just, where when he died on the cross, he didn't just die for the sins of the people who were alive when he died. Or for just for the people who sinned before the cross, but also for us who sinned long after. Right there we see that Jesus died for past, present, and future sins. Now let's add the fairness factor into it. Jesus died for the sins of everybody who lived before he, he even walked on the earth, right? Okay. How come their whole life is paid for? Their whole life is paid for. But... Not all of our whole lives when we accept Jesus. So you, now do you see how that's not fair? So if you live before the cross and you believed in Jesus, your whole life is paid for once Jesus dies on the cross. But if you accept Jesus today, well, he only paid for your sins up until now. So if you're like 20 years old, 40 years old, and you're still going to live another... 40, 60, 80 years, you have to now live perfect or you're going to go to hell. But the people back then, they got their whole life covered. So where's the, the fairness and the justice there? Right? So uh, let's move on with this. John chapter 10 at verse 9, it says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. Okay, so Jesus is the door. 
you go through him, obviously, by faith. Do you go through Jesus by keeping the law, by keeping the Sabbath, by doing good works, by going to confession, saying Hail Marys, taking the Eucharist? No, you go through him by faith, right? And as it says, shall be saved. That's not a maybe, might, could. It is a definite thing, right? But the thief comes a different way. I think it might actually talk about it a little bit here. Yeah, see, he's the door. If anybody tries to go another way, which is what these legalists are trying to do, they're trying to go through by some kind, either by the law, by religious rituals, or by good works. They're trying to go in to heaven, to the sheepfold, another way, without going through Jesus, while just paying Jesus lip service. Give Jesus some lip service, but ultimately they're trying to get in through another way. Because they lack humility. There's a whole lot of pride when it comes to these people who believe they're saved by the law and their Sabbath keeping and their religious rituals that you see through Catholicism and Orthodoxy and through the people who uh, do all these good works. And they think that because of that, they deserve heaven. But that's not how it works. Not how it works at all. Granted, you should do good works. But you shouldn't be saved for them. No matter how much good works you do, it doesn't matter how much religious rituals you do, it doesn't matter how well you keep the law, none of that makes up for killing Jesus. None of it, right? So, if you either accidentally or intentionally ran over somebody's five-year-old child, it doesn't matter if you live the rest of your life and never do that again. It doesn't make up for killing that child. Nothing you could ever think, say, or do, or not think or say or do, can make up for killing that child. Nothing. So what you need to do is look at your sin, even if you don't think it's that big a deal, you're not as bad as other people. Whatever your sin is, it has an infinite ramification that goes on forever with its influence and its effects on others. And Jesus had to die to contain that and put an end to it. Right? So whether you did it intentionally or accidentally, you put Jesus to death, the only begotten Son of God. You can't make up for that. And you need to realize that. So if you think that you're going to go to heaven and face God, and he's going to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? And you say, look at all my good works. Look at all my religious rituals. Look at how well I kept the law without getting into the detail of all that and whether your intentions are selfish just to do it to save yourself, you're like, oh, so you think that makes up for killing my son? Are you going to tell God yes? You really need to put yourself in that situation and think about this. When you face God, what, do you, what would you tell him if he asked you why you should go to heaven? You really think anything makes up for killing your son? I keep restating that to get that through to you. But anyway, let's continue on this. In Acts chapter 15 and verse 11, it says, But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Again, definite thing. And how is it you're saved? By grace. Grace is undeserved and unearned. So it's saying through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be saved. Definite thing. And it's by grace. We're not under the law. We're not under the law. We're under grace. Grace is undeserved and unearned. Being under the law means you have deserved it or earned it. Right? So through what we don't deserve and we haven't earned, 
we will be saved because of Jesus Christ. Acts 16 at verse 30, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Now, a lot of these jackasses will go to James 2, and they'll say, Well, even the devils believe there's one God. Oh, ha, 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 I got you. Where does this say, or anywhere else say, that you're saved by believing there's one God? I'm not telling you to believe in one God and be saved. So who cares if the devils believe there's one God? That doesn't save anybody. It's nonsense. Are you even thinking about these things before you say these things? I mean, man, it's, a, it's like a waste of time to have to explain something so simple. And have to explain it so many times. Uh, but anyway, again, simply by believing, shalt be saved, will, gonna happen. Not a maybe, it's a will. Right? And in this context, it's not saying, oh, if you believe, you'll be saved and everybody in your house will be saved. It says, if you believe, thou shalt be saved in thy house, if they also believe. Right? So if you and your house believe, you all be saved. Some people think that if just one of them believes, everybody is saved. No, again, you need, you know, two or three witnesses to establish a fact. And I'm giving you a bunch of different passages here. I'm giving you Mark, Luke, John, uh, Luke again, who wrote Acts, and then uh, a bunch from, from Paul. So Romans 10 at verse 9, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Again, will. This is the only condition. If you believe, it says here, confess. I, I confess it. I believe Jesus Christ died for my miserable, selfish, sinful life. And that he was buried and rose again the third day, giving me that free justification that I don't deserve. And I know that I am saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In the context of calling upon him is believing the gospel. That Jesus Christ bore your sins, was buried and rose again the third day. You believe that. You called on the Lord. You're saved. Right? doesn't say might be saved if you continue in the faith and continue in perfect obedience and doing the rituals and jumping through the flaming hoops. Standing on your head while juggling pears with your feet and lighting fire through uh, torches in your hands and gin in your mouth and all you know all these crazy things you got to do. I mean, it's like these churches want you to go through these circus acts like you're a circus animal to hopefully maybe be saved. And why do people buy into this? Because our sinful nature is very prideful. And we love thinking that we have deserved God's praise. That we have deserved heaven. We have deserved eternal life. That we have escaped hell. And that not only that, we are better than other people because of ourselves. And I like, uh, my wife is actually telling me this this morning that Satan doesn't whisper in your ear to believe in him and to worship him. He whispers in your ear to believe in yourself, to trust in yourself, to, to boost up your self-confidence. That sounds all nice in today's world, doesn't it? Have self-confidence, have some pride in yourself. 
but it's that subtlety of how Satan gets you. Because Jesus says to come to him as a humble child. Not a self-confidence man or woman. You should put your confidence completely and totally in the Lord. But anyway, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, here's a good one. At verse 10 it says, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work shall abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So, it says, he himself shall be saved. So through judgment, no matter what, if they pass judgment or not here, because it's the works that are being judged, the person's still going to be saved. How is this person still going to be saved? It's a guarantee, even past this judgment of fire, he's going to be saved. Well, because... These people who are building are building upon Jesus Christ. So they've already believed the gospel. They're born again Christians. Once you're born again, you're saved. Right? So even if your works are trashed, you're still saved. And here's a good example of it right here. A man who was sleeping with his stepmother. Right? Now... John says not to pray for a brother who does a sin that's unto death. So that would be something like murder. Whereas we see here, he uncovered his father's nakedness, which according to the Torah is punishable by death. So it says at verse 5 here, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So here we see that this person here can still be saved even in this sin where he's given over to Satan so that he can die. As we get the contrast between flesh and spirit. When he's talking about destruction of the flesh, it's talking about destruction of the literal body. Not metaphorically, symbolically, as it, the spirit is not symbolic, it's literal. It's saying that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. A lot of these people like to twist that and say, oh, the destruction of the flesh is uh, just some kind of chastisement to bring him to repentance. It's, no, it's not. Because it's saying that he's going to die and that he may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, which is a, in the future. Not that he may be saved once he repents. No, it, he, they're expecting him to die. That's why in 2 Corinthians, Paul has to tell the Corinthians to let the man back after he repented. Because he told them here to let Satan have Adam and kill him. They were expecting him to die and not come back. So they were just like not letting him back in. But they were like, no, 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 he has repented. He's changed. He's come back, right? So they completely ripped this out of context to fit their belief, which is complete and total arrogance. But anyway, uh, we see this in connection where coming into 1 Corinthians 15 again, where it tells us the gospel. It says here, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. This is what we're saved by right here. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, if, unless ye have believed in vain. Believing in vain is like believing falsely. Right? And like you take the Lord's name in vain, it's like you being uh, an Israelite or you calling yourself a Christian, yet... You don't treat God as your God. You don't treat him as your husband. And you rely on yourself, right? Like a lot of women, I don't need a man. And you're acting like, I don't need a God. You're doing it yourself. Or you just use God to get stuff that you need or want or, you know, pray for those things. And if he won't answer you, you'll find another way to get what you want. And by doing this, you've taken his name in vain. Or you're calling yourself an Israelite, you're calling yourself a Christian, and you're not living up to the standard. Right? 
you're not following the faith, you're taking his name in vain, right? Which is what this guy was doing here, right? He wasn't believing in vain necessarily, but he was taking the Lord's name in vain. So it says here, unless you believe in vain, vain can also mean falsely, right? Like feigned words or something like that, false words. It says here, verse 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So we see that if you believe in your heart that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day, that is what saves you unless you believe falsely, in vain. Right? So that's why Paul says right here, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, because if this man truly believes the gospel, well then, when his works are tried, he himself shall still be saved, even though his works were trash, and they are burned up. Because you're not saved of yourself. You're not saved by your works. You're not saved by your obedience to the law. You're not saved by your religious rituals. You're saved by the grace of God. Grace is undeserved and unearned. You're saved because God loves you and that you believe that love. You trust that God loves you enough and that he's powerful enough to take away your sins and to give you a new life. And some of these people, Christians, have the faith to take that and then go run into the world and live how they want. Like this man here. He still shall be saved, but he's going to lose rewards. Some of those rewards might be family and friends that he could have been a witness to that could spend eternal life with him, but instead he wanted to do his own thing. Let's go over here. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15, it says, For we are unto God a seat, sweet sweet. Yeah. Let me redo that. My tongue twisted up on me there. For we are unto God a sweet Savior of Christ, and them that are saved, and in them that perish. So it talks about how them that are saved. That's present tense. And Paul is a sweet Savior. To me and other Christians that are saved. Right? Uh, so anyway, let's look at this. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 through 9 here. It says, But God who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. That's bring us to life. That's being reborn. Right? In the spirit. By grace are you saved, by something you don't deserve and haven't earned. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace, again, stuff we don't deserve and haven't earned, in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace, haven't earned or deserved, ye are saved. Are ye saved? That's present tense. Through faith. That not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The salvation is a gift. It's a gift of grace. The gift is something you don't deserve, haven't earned, you don't pay for. You receive that through your faith by believing and trusting God. Not of works, because if it was of works, you would boast. It does say uh, in verse 10 that we're created to do good works. And a lot of people say that I would ignore that. No, I don't. You're ignoring this. You need to first be saved. Then you do good works. You don't do good works to be saved. Once you're saved, you do good works because you love and appreciate God. You love your fellow man. And you can actually do things out of a pure heart. Because until you're saved, everything you're doing is selfishly motivated to save yourself. You're not doing things out of a pure heart and pure motivation. Titus. 3 at 5 it says not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us present tense already saved us 
by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified, present tense again, by his grace, we shall be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So again, present tense saved, present tense justified, by grace, what we don't deserve and haven't earned, by the regenerating and renewing of the Holy Ghost shed upon us through Jesus Christ. That's about being reborn as we look at Ephesians chapter 1, and at verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, being Jesus Christ, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the gospel that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, rose again the third day, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So as soon as you believed, you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. We see that in Acts chapter 10, when Peter was preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, and they received the Holy Ghost, and he was like, hey, can't we get these people baptized who received the Holy Spirit? Because they believed the gospel that he preached to them at the end of Acts chapter 10. They received it because they believed in their heart, right? So once we believe, we are present tensely saved. That's how the Holy Spirit can be in us, and we're the holy temple of the, of the Spirit of God, right? Because we've been cleansed and washed of our sins in his blood. So the Holy Spirit can't dwell in us unless we've already been atoned. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, it says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So there, again, ha saved us. Hath would mean has. Who has saved us, which is already done. Already saved us. Jesus up there on the cross, he says, it is finished. Didn't say, I almost got it done. Just a little bit more. As long as they follow in the law, then this is the done deal. No, he said, I finished it. It's done. Right? And it's through the gospel. Like we're already reading. Once you hear the word of truth, you believe the gospel of your salvation. You're sealed with that Holy Spirit. You are present tensely saved. Here again, the gospel. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. John 3. There's another one I can bring in. Whoever believes on Jesus is not condemned. But who believes not is condemned already. That's salvation right there by simply believing. John 5, 24. Whoever believes on Jesus is not going to come into judgment. They pass from death to life. Right? And I want to bring up a couple of objections now before I wrap this up. Because there are a lot of people who will bring on certain uh, passages talking about like uh, stipulations and stuff tied to being saved. Uh, this is one of them. First Peter chapter 4, verse 18, it says, And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? And they act as though this means that uh, you're not saved or you're not eternally secure. I mean, how does it say that you're, you're scarcely saved? Take away from the fact that you are saved. I, I don't get how they see that. But a verse to keep in mind here. It says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? What shall be the end of them that believe not the gospel of God? So we see here, 
It's about those who don't believe the gospel, and I've already gone over the gospel several times here. This is about those who don't believe. What is the uh, only requirement that you have to obey concerning the gospel, the good news? That's to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. Those are the requirements that you realize that you're a sinner. You're nailed there up on the cross like the thief. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. You're condemned and you deserve it. You get to that point and you believe in your heart that God loves you anyway and that he dies for you. He takes you down from that cross. You are saved. He's not going to put you back up there. But we are scarcely saved like that thief on the cross who's about ready to go to hell and he gets saved by the skin of his teeth there, right? We don't realize that we're all there spiritually on that cross before we accept the gospel. Any moment, God could be like, enough of this and drop the hammer and you're done and that's that. And when you're saved, it's scarcely. Right? So if we're barely saved, well, how's it going to be for those who don't believe the gospel? Mm -hmm. And uh, the other passages is right here. I would like to use the e-sword more, but when I use my screen capture, a lot of times it just either crashes or it crashes the whole computer for some reason. But if I don't do anything, I just do this, it should be fine, as long as I don't try to click on anything. But anyway... A uh, couple passages here, such as Matthew 24, 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Uh, Mark 13, 13. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure on, unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, that's saying, see, you got to endure to the end to be saved. But you see, they need to take the salvation in the context. Every context that I brought up to you, when it, concerning salvation, was the salvation of your soul, not the salvation of your flesh, not being saved from an army coming to destroy your nation or your city, it, not being saved from the government coming to behead you, not being saved from the fire that, that you're caught in, not being saved from the quicksand or a flood or a lion. You're not being saved physically at all. Every passage I brought up had to do with the salvation of your soul, your eternal salvation. These passages have to do the salvation of your flesh. As Matthew 24, 13, those that will endure to the end shall be saved. Verse 20, uh, 22 of Matthew 24, and except those days shall be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall, shall be, be shortened. Coming back over here to Mark 13, 13, right? You get endured to the end? Well, Mark 13, 20. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. So when he's talking about enduring to the end, he's talking about those going through the tribulation, that they're going to have to endure to the end if their physical bodies are to be saved and preserved. All right? No flesh will be saved unless they endure to the end of the tribulation. This is not the salvation of your soul. Okay? So, uh, you got to watch out. It's all about context. People just be like, oh, see, it said saved. Yeah, but there's times where uh, Noah saved from a flood. That's his physical salvation. You got Israel being saved from armies. Right? You, you got all these different types of salvation that are not eternal salvation. Right? So, you need to look at the context. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to bring that up to end it for anybody who wants to throw some doubt. There's all kinds of people who want to throw doubt. They don't want you to trust God. They want you to doubt the Word of God. They want you to doubt your salvation so that you are jumping through flaming hoops constantly trying to save yourself. And what that does is it draws your attention away from God and away from others and it puts your attention on yourself and makes you self-absorbed and turns you into a prideful, arrogant Pharisees where you start to think you deserve heaven and other people don't because they're not being like you. And you're working hard and doing these things to be better and they're not. So they deserve hell and you don't. When a sinner's a sinner, nobody's perfect. 
and God's no respecter of persons. So if you want to be justified by the law, by your religious rituals, by your good works, you have to be perfect with perfect intention. It means good intention out of love for God and love for your fellow man, not anything about yourself in any way whatsoever. If it's not perfect, then you're going to be judged and condemned with all the people who are Christ deniers, atheists, Muslims, Satanists, all the, the whole nine yards there, right? So anyway, thanks for watching and take care.